guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering the integumentary system, the skin. Um, if you guys haven't done so already, please don't forget to like and subscribe below. Guys, I'm also on TikTok now. I'm on TikTok and Instagram. My handle is still the same, Nexus Nursing. Also, my audio lessons are now available on my website. So. And I have something for everyone, guys. If you're the kind of student that you just love hearing my voice point things out to you, you do your due diligence, you study, you read, you practice questions, you just want to hear me say, hey, this is important, this is important. You're going to see this on the test. You better know this. I got you. If you're one of those students who love to be spoon-fed, you just want to hear my voice reading to you, explaining to you what your textbook is trying to say, pointing out important things to, that you need to know, but really breaking it down, I got you as well. So guys, don't forget, check me out on my website, Nexus Nursing Institute. Nexus Nursing Institute, scroll down to audio lessons. I got something for everyone. Whatever you're learning in school right now that you just need that extra push, go ahead and check it out. All right, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. First question. The client has full thickness burns to 65% of the body, including the chest area. After establishing a patent airway, which collaborative intervention is priority for the client? One, replace fluids and electrolytes. Two, prevent contractures of extremities. Three, monitor urine output hourly. Or four, prepare to assist with escardomy. All right, guys, and the correct answer is one, replace fluids and electrolytes. So let me tell you something. When it comes to burns, your three biggest concerns, and you have a lot, but the three biggest is going to be infection, dehydration, and pain, okay? That needs to be addressed. Now, between those three, look at our choices. What is going to kill our patient the fastest? that dehydration, because what happens is all of the fluid leaves the vascular space and it go, uh, goes out into the tissues. And so that's why this patient will be all swollen and edematous, but really their organs are shutting down because the organs aren't being perfused. Why? All of the blood, the fluid, the nutrients, the vitamins, you name it, have left the vascular space and it went out to the tissues. So number one, replace fluid and electrolytes. Guys, I tell you this all the time. Physiological integrity is always going to be a priority. What is physiological integrity? Fluid electrolytes, nutrition, glucose, ABCs, vital signs, anything that physically keeps your patient alive, that's going to take priority. So for this, absolutely, it's going to be fluid and electrolytes. Next question. The client scheduled to have a xenograft of the left lower leg burn. The client asks the nurse, what is a xenograft? I'm sorry, I lost my space. <laughs> oh, there we are. What is a xenograft? Which statement by the nurse would be the best response? One, the doctor will graft skin from your back of the leg. B, excuse me, two, the skin from a donor will be used to cover your burn. Three, the graft will come from an animal, probably a pig. Or four, I think you should ask your doctor about the graft. And guys, the correct answer is three. The graft will come from an animal, probably a pig. That is a xenograft, okay? It's a, uh, the piece, a uh, body part, the, that skin that comes from an animal. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. Number one, the doctor will graft skin from your back to your leg. When you're getting skin from one side of your own body to another part of your own body, that's autograft, okay? So number one would be autograft. Choice two, the skin will come from a donor, from somebody else. That will be homograft. And then choice four, excuse me? What do you mean? I think you should talk to your doctor about that. Do we ever pass the buck? Absolutely not. You don't pass the buck on something you can take care of. Absolutely not. You can answer that question, so you're not going to pass the buck to the doctor. You're going to add, answer that patient's question, right? So, guys, the correct answer is three. Next question. The ICU um, burn nurse is developing a nursing care plan for a client with severe, full thickness, and deep partial thickness burns over half of the body. Which client problem has priority? One, high risk for infection. Two, ineffective coping. 
three, impaired physical mobility, or four, knowledge deficit. And you guys should already know the answer to this because I told you when a patient has a burn that your three biggest priorities are what? Infection and what else? Pain and what else? Dehydration. Out of this list that we're looking at, what is most likely going to kill the patient the fastest? The infection. And here's how they tricked you because they put risk for in front of infection. Because usually when we're looking for a priority, we're not going to choose a risk for if there's something actually going on with the patient, right? But look at our other choices. Ineffective coping. So that's psycho psychosocial, psychological. That psychological is not going to take precedence over the possibility of that physical, which is your infection. Next, impaired physical mobility. Yes, impaired physical mobility is a problem. The patient's gonna be impaired, pain, they're not gonna to wanna to move. Patient can get contractures, but that's not gonna kill them like an infection is, okay? And choice four, knowledge deficit, no. That's not gonna take precedence over the chance of the patient having the infection. Why? Because that chance of the patient having the infection is so high in a burn patient. That is our three top concerns with burn, infection, dehydration, and pain. So the correct answer is high risk for infection. Even though it's a risk for, that risk is very real and it's gonna take precedence over the other issues, okay? Because when it comes to those burn patients, everything has to be sterile. We have, because remember, I want you to think about it this way, guys. Your skin is your first line of defense, okay? Your skin is a barrier that keeps the pathogens and those microbes and those viruses and those antibiotics and everything else. That's what keeps them out. So if the patient has a burn to their skin, that first line of defense is gone. So absolutely, that patient's gonna be at high risk for infection and you have to protect that patient so this Guys, I will argue with you from here to forever. Even though it says high risk, even though that word risk is there, that still takes precedence over the other choices. That's how important um, uh, preventing infection is to the burn patient. The nurse writes a nursing diagnosis, impaired skin integrity related to open burn wounds. Which intervention would be appropriate for this nursing diagnosis? A, I keep saying A, one, provide analgesia before pain becomes severe. Two, clean the wounds, clean the wounds, body, and hair daily. Three, screen visitors for respiratory infections. Or four, encourage visitors to bring plants and flowers. And guys, the correct answer is to cleanse the client's wounds, body, and hair. Let's go back to the diagnosis that we're talking about impaired skin integrity related to open burn. Didn't I just tell you once the integrity of that skin is open, patients at risk for what? Infection. So what are we gonna do to prevent infection? Clean those wounds. And not only the, the wounds on the skin, clean the hair that's on the skin. Does that make sense, guys? I'm drilling this into your head because that's how important preventing infection is to that patient that is a, a burn victim, okay, or a, a burn patient. Very important. You want to address infection. You want to keep that skin clean. You want to keep pathogens on the skin. You want to make sure that no pathogens get into that wound and the patient develops an infection. Which nursing intervention should be included for the client who has full thickness and deep partial thickness burns to 50% of the body, select all that applies? Guys, how do we treat select all that applies? As true or false? Very good. So let's go. One, perform meticulous hand hygiene. Absolutely true. We're going to do hand hygiene because we want to prevent infection. Absolutely. Two, use sterile gloves for wound care. Absolutely, we're gonna use sterile gloves. Why? We want to prevent infection, true. Three, wear gown and mask during uh, procedures. Guys, with this one, uh, three, wear gown and mask during procedures. Absolutely, you wanna wear gown and mask during procedures. Why? And I wanna explain that to you. When patient has, let's go back to the question. It says they have full thickness, a deep partial to 50% of their body. The last thing that you want to do is cause cross-contamination of infection, infected areas, right? So every area that you, that, that you um, clean, you want to make sure you don't cause cross-contamination. Um, 
So absolutely, you're going to wear a gown. You're going to wear a mask. You don't want um, one area of the patient's skin that you're doing wound care on to get that bacteria that's in that area to transfer it somewhere else. Absolutely. And although also guys, when you're doing, um, you're cleaning out these wounds, you don't want to get the, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not fluid drainage, right? You're expecting for there to be drainage, right? So you're going to protect yourself as well. You're going to be wearing that gown because you're cleaning out a wound. There's high chances. There's going to be drainage, including blood. Absolutely. Um, four, change invasive lines once a week. Guys, we want to prevent infection. So four is wrong. Once a week? No, we're going to do that daily. Daily. Why? We want to prevent infection. So that uh, changing uh, invasive lines once a week, we're doing that daily. We cannot take that chance for that patient get infected. So that's false. And choice five, administer antibiotics as prescribed. Absolutely. Why? We want to prevent infection. So the correct answer is one, two, three, and then five. All of those to prevent infection. Um, four is incorrect. We're not going to be doing it once a week. We're going to be doing it daily. We're going to be changing those lines daily. The nurse is caring for a client with deep partial thickness, full thickness burns to the um, excuse me, to the chest area, which assessment data would warrant notifying the doctor. One, the client's complaining of severe pain. Two, the client's pulse ox is 95. Three, the client has a temperature of 100.4, uh, pulse 100, respiration 24, and blood pressure 102 over 60. Or four, the client's urinary output is 50 mLs in two hours. And guys, the correct answer is four, that urine output's 50 mLs in two hours. What is the hourly urine output supposed to be? Minimum is 30. If this patient has less than 50 in two hours, so they're producing less than 25 mLs each hour. Did you know that urine output is one of the most sensitive indicators to when a patient's going through dehydration, going through shock? What happens is when the patient doesn't have enough fluid in the vessels, like in burn, when all of the fluids leave the vascular space and they go out to the tissues, what happens is when those organs are not being perfused, because remember, the blood and that fluid is what's carrying the oxygen, vitamins, nutrients, minerals, right? If it's not in the vessels, that means it's not going to the organs. When the organs aren't being perfused, you want to know what happens. Your body's to, meant to survive no matter what. Your organ starts to shut down because it's trying to hold on to every little bit of fluid that it has. So your kidney shut down because it's trying to hold on to the fluid because you already don't have enough fluid. You think it's trying to let go of even more fluid via urine? No. So your kidney shut down. So one of the first indicators that lets us know something's severely wrong, this patient is not being perfused, there's not enough uh, fluid in the vessels, is we see that urine output start to go down, the kidneys shut down, okay? So seeing that the urine client's urinary output is 50 milliliters in two hours, that lets us know something's severely wrong. Patients most likely not, uh, those organs aren't being perfused and you need to place a call out to the doctor, okay? One of the worst things that can happen to a patient that is a burn patient is them going into shock. Because remember I told you, when it comes to burns, infection, pain, and dehydration. And that dehydration can be so bad, the fluid, um, so much fluid has less of vascular space that it throws that patient into shock. And the patient's organs start to shut down, such as the kidneys, such as the spleen, such as the liver, such as the brain. Okay, so number four, absolutely, we're gonna notify the physician immediately. All of the other choices are bad, they need to be addressed, but what's gonna kill the patient the fastest? Guys, whenever you guys have a question to ask you, what's the priority? You have to say to yourself, what is going to kill my patient the fastest? That's your priority, and it's gonna be that patient going through shock. The client's admitted with full thickness and partial thickness burns to more than 30% of the body. The nurse is concerned with the client's nutritional status. Which intervention should the nurse implement? One, encourage the client's family to bring their favorite foods. Two, provide low fat, low, chole low cholesterol diet for the client. Three, monitor the client's weight weekly in the same clothes. Or four, make referral to hospital social worker. And guys, the correct answer is one. 
not to, there are too many conditions that I can think of where we actually encourage the client family to bring food from home and whatever that client wants to eat, we're going to give it to them. Burns is one of them. Why? Again, guys, that dehydration, and I'm going to break it down so you understand. A big part of what happens in burns is that protein part of the blood, which is albumin, that's the type of protein, it leaves the vascular space. And wherever that protein goes, the fluid follows. That's actually what's causing the dehydration. So not only is this patient at high risk for dehydration, this patient um, is having low protein. Well, guess what protein's good for? Wound healing. That's why whenever patients have wounds, we give them a high protein diet because protein's good for wound healing. We give them high protein, high vitamin C. High vitamin C is good for healing. High calorie. Why? Calorie gives you energy. The patient needs energy to fight off the infection. They need energy to fight those wounds and get better, right? So wound, um, burns is one of those conditions where whatever that patient wants to eat, we're gonna give it to them because they're so at risk for uh, losing weight, not eating, and being nutritionally unstable, okay? So we're gonna encourage the family to, for, to bring in their favorite foods and we're gonna push protein, vitamin C, calories, okay? We need that patient, and carbs, we need that patient to have energy fight that infection, okay? And remember, the patient has wounds, their body's trying to fight off um, those burn wounds. So their metabol that's not a word, metabolic, that's not a word. Their metabolism has increased. The demand for that metabolism to increase has gone even higher because they're trying to fight that burn that they've experienced, okay? So they need lots of foods. All right, the client sustained a hot grease burn to the right hand and calls the ER for advice. Which information should the nurse provide to the client? One, apply ice pack to the right hand. Two, place the hand in cool water. Three, be sure to rupture any blister formation. Or four, go to the doctor's office immediately. And guys, the correct answer is two, place the hand in cool water. And I know a lot of people, they think when they get a burn from grease, you know, they put ice on it, but you are not supposed to put ice on it. And here's why. What does ice do? Vasoconstrict. So here you are, you have a site of injury where you need blood, oxygen, vitamin, nutrients, minerals. You need them all to rush to the site of injury, but you put ice that's going to constrict the vessels, that's going to slow down the oxygen, vitamin, nutrients. Does that make any kind of sense? In what world? And not only are you causing vasoconstriction, so you're slowing down the help to get into that area. Not only are you doing that, what does that ice do? That ice can cause damage to the tissue. So we do not put ice on burns. No, that's a big no-no, so that's wrong. Three, <laughs> rupture blister formation. Oh, we're trying to get that patient to get infection. Is that what we're doing? Is that what, we, are we in the game? Are we in the business of making patients get infections? Why would you tell them to rupture anything? Absolutely not. So that's wrong. And then what was our last choice? Immediately go to the doctor's office. Actually for burns, patients need to go to the ER, not the doctor's office. So the correct answer, you're going to tell them to put it um, under, um, put their hand in cool water, and then following that, they can go ahead to the ER, okay? Guys, I'm sorry if I seem a little bit agitated. I've been working all day and I'm so tired, I wanna go to bed, but if I don't, didn't make this video for you tonight, you weren't gonna get it till uh, next week, so I'm sorry, forgive me. All right, next question. The client's been discharged after being in the burn unit for six weeks. Which strategy should the nurse identify to promote the client's mental health? One, encourage the client to stay at home as much as possible. Two, discuss the importance of not relying on the family for needs. Three, tell the client to remember that changes in lifestyle may take time. Or four, instruct the client to discuss feelings only with the therapist. Okay guys, and to help 
that patient mentally, you're gonna tell them three. You're gonna tell them to remember that changes in lifestyle takes time. If you don't tell them that, that patient's gonna do what? Get frustrated, get angry. You have to let them know that it is gonna take time. That's going to help them. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, encourage them to stay at home as much as possible. No, that's not gonna help them psychologically. If anything, we want them what? To resume um, previous activities. So that's wrong. We want them to resume regular activities. Remember guys, in nursing, we always want to promote independence. We always want the patient to do as much for themselves. We don't even step in until they've done as much for themselves as they could, and then we step in. Oh, looks like I got colic. And then we step in. So we want them to resume activities. So number one's wrong. That's not gonna be good for their psyche. Number two, discuss the importance of not relying on family for needs. Having a burn is like one of the worst experiences possible. It's very painful. This patient is hardly going to be able to move. So guess what? They are going to be relying on family or loved ones. So you don't teach them the importance of not relying on family or loved ones. What do you think that's going to do to their psyche? They're going to, it's going to make them even more depressed that they need help. You're going to let them know they are going to need help and that's okay that they need help. And it's okay to reach out to people that they love and they trust and that supports them. So that's wrong. And then uh, instruct the client to discuss feelings only with the therapist? Absolutely not. You're gonna encourage them to discuss their feelings with you, the nurse, and with anyone that they trust, right? You're gonna teach them that that's okay. Why? We want them to express their feelings. We want them to get it all out. Why? Because if they don't and they internalize that anger, they internalize that frustration, what does that turn into? Depression. Depression, guys, is just anger and frustration turned towards self. So we want patients talking about their feelings. All right, next question. The nurses in a long-term care facility is teaching a group of new unlicensed assistive personnel. Which information regarding skin care should the nurse emphasize? One, keep the skin moist by leaving the skin damp after a bath. Two, do not rub any lotion into the skin. Three, turn the clients who are immobile at least every two hours. Or four, only the licensed nursing staff may care for the client's skin. And I know you guys all got this answer, correct? If three, you're going to turn the patient at least every two hours. You guys know that. Now, let's look at our other choices. One, keeping that skin moist after a damn bath. That's one of the ways that you're going to make that patient get an ulcer, right? We don't keep that patient's skin wet, so that's false. Two, do not rub any lotion into the skin. That is false. When that patient's skin is not moisturized, it's easy for the skin to open. And before you know it, you got a, a um, um, pressure ulcer that went from a one to a two. Now let's talk about this very quickly. I'm getting off topic. But a pressure uh, ulcer, a pressure ulcer one, that's when you um, put pressure on the skin and it doesn't blanch. That's a one. Once that skin opens up, you're into a two. Okay, so um, you want that skin to be moisturized because when that skin's dry and it's not moisturized, it's very easy for the skin, the integrity of the skin to be damaged. So that's false. And choice four, only the nursing staff can care for the skin. No, this is a collaborative effort. Everyone on the team has to care for the patient's skin. So the correct answer is three, you're gonna turn that patient at least every two hours. The nurse is caring for a client who has developed stage four pressure ulcers on the left trochanter and coccyx. Which collaborative problem has the highest priority? One, impaired cognition. Two, altered nutrition. Three, self-care deficit. Or four, altered coping. And guys, I gave you this answer when I was explaining something else, so I hope you remembered it. The correct answer is two, altered nutrition. What does this patient need more of to help with the wound healing? Protein, protein, vitamin C. They need that nutrition to help with the wound healing, guys. Altered nutrition, physiological integrity. The nurse is caring for clients in a long-term care facility, which is a modifiable risk factor for the development of pressure ulcers. One, constant perennial moisture. Two, ability of the clients to reposition themselves. Three, decreased elasticity of the skin. Four, impaired cardiovascular perfusion of the periphery. 
And guys, the correct answer is one, constant perennial moisture. That's the only modifiable risk factor on this list. A modifiable risk factor is something that the patient has control over, something they can change. Well, the patient or the nursing staff, I should say. And that right there, the constant perennial moisture, that is something that can be changed. How? Checking the patient more often, changing that patient more often, offering a bedpan or taking them to the bathroom more often. They don't have to sit there in the urine and feces. Now, choices two, three, and four, these are risk factors that can't be changed. There's no power over it. So those are non-modifiable risk factors. So that's why one is our answer. All right, guys, and we are down to our last question. What is the scientific rationale for placing lift pads under an immobile client? One, the pads will absorb any urinary incontinence and contain stool. Two, the pads will prevent the client from being diaphoretic. Three, the pads will keep the staff from workplace injuries such as pulled muscle. Or four, the pads will prevent friction shearing when repositioning the client. And guys, the correct answer is four. It's gonna prevent friction shearing. This client's immobile. They can't help you. They can't push themselves up or down. So when you're using that lift pad, that's gonna prevent um, the shearing force of that skin when you're moving the patient and you, this, the patient's going this way, but their skin going that way. It's gonna prevent that from happening, okay? So that's why number four is the correct answer. Guys, in all honesty, and I always tell you this, I'll never lie to you, I'll always tell you the truth. In all honesty, I have so much more questions to cover with you, but I'm blown tired and I'm losing focus. I can't even think. So that's why I'm ending it now. But I'm going to go ahead and make sure I make a part two for you when I'm awake, alert, and oriented times three. But for this video, that is it. Please watch out for the part two of Integumentary. And uh, oh, I want to say, guys, thank you so much. Over on TikTok, uh, last night I hit 150,000 followers. 150,000. I'm over here on YouTube and I can't even get 10,000. Like I'm struggling right now. I think I'm at 9,800. I can't even get 10,000. But on TikTok, I'm at 150,000. So guys, I want to say thank you so much. Please continue sharing my content with anyone that you think uh, my videos would benefit. Please don't forget to go ahead, check me out on TikTok and Instagram, Nexus Nursing. And if you need that push, you really want to increase your grades you want to increase your grades by a letter or higher, go to my website, Nexus Nursing Institute. Check out my audio lessons. Whatever you're learning in school, go ahead, listen to my audio lessons. Hear what I have to say about it so it's reinforced when you hear it in class and you read about it in the book. Guys, thank you so much for sharing this time with me, and I'll see you on my next video.